the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit to be with you all. The Lord to be with you. Let us pray. Care for your church, O Lord, with perpetual mercy. Since we totter and are sure to fall without your grace, remove what will harm us and arrange what will make us whole. Grant this, we pray, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. The first reading is from Isaiah, the 51st chapter. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation, for a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands will hope for me, and for my arms they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. The word of the Lord. We will now read Psalm 138 responsively. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. For you have glorified your name and your word above all things. All the kings of the earth will praise you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. Though the Lord be high, he cares for the lowly. He perceives the haughty from afar. The Lord will make good his purpose for me. O Lord, your love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. The second reading is from Romans chapter 11. O oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this word, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, to not think of himself more highly than he thought than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, 
each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not ha all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in his generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness, the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are to you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ, the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Many, many years ago, when I was just starting out here in the rostered ministry, part of our internship, or part of our seminary career is to spend a year in internship. I was assigned to a small congregation in a very rough part of town in Columbia, South Carolina. When I got there, uh, I instituted some Bible studies and those type of things. And when ever I was at the church, there was this one couple. There was Dick and Dinah. Now, Dick was a World War II veteran. He stood about 6'4". And Dinah, if she weighed 90 pounds... It, it might have been a, a strong breeze would have blown over, and she was about four nine. So they were a sight to see, just seeing them standing next to each other. Now, I found Dick to be quite a character. Now I'm telling you, they were always at the church, Dick and Nina. So I had an interest because Dick was a World War II veteran, and and we had common ground because I had been in the army. And, you know, at this point, I'd only been out of the Army three years. <clears throat> and so we'd always talk. Well, come to find out, Dick had not been coming to church very long. He had only started coming to church in his early 70s. Now, he was 83, 84 at the time, and so... You're saying, how was he a veteran? He joined, he joined the Army when he was 30 years old to fight World War II. He was on day three, uh, D plus three on the invasion of Normandy, of Europe. So, uh, Anne, Anne had a Purple Heart and eventually got wounded. And it was interesting. I got to know Dick really well because he got sick. 
And so I started visiting him a lot in the hospital and in his home. Now, when I visited him, he had a chair. How many, how many of you guys have a chair? That's your chair, right? Next to his chair, well, and, and some of the women have their chair, right? So you, we, we have our chairs. Well, Dick had his chair, and it had a reading lamp, and it had a Bible. It was well worn. And I'm telling you, he didn't start going to church until he was, this Christ Lutheran church, until he was 73. And Dick liked to talk about his Lord. And how it transformed his life. And see, because from the time he got home from the war until he was 73 years old, the world dominated Dick's life. I did, he was my first funeral that I actually conducted. And his daughter came up, his, actually it was his son-in-law came up and said, I gotta put something in his casket just in case he gets thirsty. He put a fifth of wild turkey in there. They said, What do you think, Pastor? I said, Why not? What else was I gonna say? That it wouldn't be a pretty But so that it kind of describes the person, a part of who Dick was. See, now so there's the center. And he was working real hard to be the saint. And there was other stories about Dick's life after the war until he was about 73. That's really not worth mentioning in mixed company. But I want to lift that up because Dick would lift it up. How much the world and sin had just, just had a grip on him. But during that whole time, he took care of his family. He took care of Nina. He did what men do. They take care of their family. And Nina never quit praying for him endlessly. She never quit witnessing. She never quit going to church. Every Sunday morning, He'd be there with a hangover. She would fix him breakfast, and he'd go, and he, she would go off to church. That was what she did from World War II until the 80s. But her prayer was for Dick to find the Lord. And she just kept witnessing by the way she lived and conducted her life no matter how much the world had his life the happiest and she would, te she would tell you the happiest day of her life she, she, by the way she was in the choir now this was the most dedicated choir I've ever been around and not one person in that bunch could sing in tune. <laughs> and I don't think the organist had ever had a lesson on how to play the organ. But you know what? They came every practice. They came every Sunday morning, and they sang gloriously. And actually, the choir, this is a side note, this is a good witness. The choir director's whole purpose of my year of internship was to get me to sing out loud. No matter how, because I couldn't be any more off key than they were. <laughs> but, you know, as a great witness, they found it important to be a part of that. And it was their great witness for them to continually stand up there and sing with all their glory. And Nina was a part of that group, so she always got to church early. She'd get up, fix Dick's breakfast, and off she'd go. Because choir, that choir practiced on Sunday morning for 15 or 20 minutes. That might have been part of their issue. I don't know. So she's at the church early, and she's in the choir loft. It'd be like sitting up here. 
when this pastor has started worship, they've done a brief order confession, and she looks up, and here came Dick in his best suit. From the end of World War II, from his 30s to his 70s, he had not walked. And after that day, he never missed another Sunday. And I'm going to tell you, on his reading table right next to him was the scriptures. Now, Dick knew how much of a sinner he was. As a matter of fact, he said, my daughter was the designated uh, alkalite that year. And she would be the communion assistant, so we had a pouring chalice. And so she would pour him the blood and the, the, the blood of Christ that shed for you. And he'd take it. And he'd put it out again. He said, it's been a long time. I need two of these. <laughs> My daughter, though, the 11-year-old, go, no, one's good. It wouldn't move on. Like I said, Dick was my first funeral. And also, the story is about Nina's witness. She was the rock in his life that brought him back to Christ. Brought him back to his birth place. For he was a baptized child of God. Born in Columbia, South Carolina, you better believe that. In the 19, early 1900s. He had been baptized. But he had lost his ways from who he really was. And Nina's witness brought him back. We read today in Isaiah listen to me you who pursue righteousness you who seek the Lord look to the rock from which you were hung and to the quarry from which you were dug we had Nina's witness but what Dick was was a baptized child of God see deep down he knew who he was and where he had come from and Isaiah is reminding the children of Israel, and he's reminding us today, when we forget who we are and whose we are, we are to look to that baptism, our baptism, and remember that we are a child of God, and through his body and blood, and through that baptism, we are forgiven. That's what Dick experienced, no matter how big a sinner he was, when he received the sacrament. He was forgiven. All that had happened before. And Paul writes in Romans, first chapter. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, and by testing, your, and by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Through Nina's witness, she showed Dick another way that opposed the world's ways. And it took a while. But one day he responded and started learning again what it meant to be a child of God. And to seek God's ways. And remember I told you he had a Bible right next to his table. Right next to his chair. He studied the word of God. And it's never too late. So that he would live in the Lord's way.
It would be easy today when we read the gospel to just look at how great Peter is. Look what Jesus did to Peter. How many have read it that way? Because he does. He says, he, he singles out Peter and says, Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, You are the Christ. And Jesus tells him, I tell you, Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He's not talking about Peter's strength of character and how wonderful he is and how righteous Peter was. I mean, Peter, when he walked, he got out of the boat to walk to Jesus, but he couldn't walk 10 feet towards Jesus, and he got distracted and started sinking in the water. In Sunday school today, in, uh, in Luther class, they were talking about how Peter denies Jesus three times after telling him he won't. Peter runs to the tomb. He lets the younger guy beat him. Sees that it's empty, and what does he do? Does he go tell anybody? No, he goes and hides behind closed doors. Then, they don't know what, he doesn't know what to do, so he just goes back to Galilee. Has he told anybody about Jesus? No. He just goes back to Galilee, and at the end of the Gospel of John, the end of the Gospel of John, Jesus finds Peter and the disciples going back to what they were doing before, fishing. And Jesus comes to him and says, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, No, this is the disciple who had witnessed to him, but now had gone back to the world. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lamb. Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, Do you love me? And Peter said to him, Jesus, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. In all that Peter had done to not witness to Jesus, Jesus still came to him and he gave Peter what he needed to live and the witness to him in which his church would then be built. His community of believers. And after saying these, this, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. I just saw this this week. The last words Jesus says to Peter is follow me. The first two words Jesus says to Peter is follow me. He said, follow me, and Peter got up and did. Then he didn't, does all that stuff that just questions if he really did believe in him. And then Jesus reminds him again, follow me. And what does Peter do? He goes and witnesses to the world. To the point, here we are. He witnessed to the disciples, who witnessed to others, who witnessed to their children, who witnessed to friends, who witnessed on and on and on through the ages.
And that is the rock that the church stands on. It is everyone in this room is the rock. It is our witness that the church will prevail against the gates of hell. It is our witness today that will bring the church of tomorrow. It is our witness that will fulfill these pews. Not just mine, not just Peter's, not just what's in here. As I said, 40 some years, Nina witnessed to Dick. And moved him from being completely dominated by the world to living a life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is the rock in which the church stands. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God has made us his people through baptism into Christ, living together in trust and hope. We confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He sundered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and it is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Rex, if you'll join me, please.
Many of you may know Rex Mann. When we were talking today, he asked about a month ago, he said, I'm ready to become a part of your community officially. We're having a congregation uh, meeting here shortly, and I thought he should be able to participate in that. So it's not in your bulletin. And plus, Rex is a farmer and travels at times. Uh, it's state fair season, so it's been a question if he's, you know, at some times he's not here. But here he is today, and we're going to bring him in as a transfer. So um, Rex Mann has come to us from Oklahoma. What was the name of the church out there? Resurrection Lutheran Church. He desires to transfer his membership into our community of faith. We welcome you as a member of St. John's Lutheran Church and the Angelical Lutheran Church to join with us in worshiping God, hearing his word, and sharing his supper, proclaiming the good news of God and Christ through word and deed, serving all people and striving for justice and peace in all the earth. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their need. You can stay seated, but let us pray. Heavenly gracious God, we gather this day. We rejoice that Rex has, has chosen to join us and to be a part of our faith community, to go out and to serve, to grow in our discipleship together. It has been truly a pleasure on my part that you have brought him to us, and we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Heavenly, gracious Father, we pray this morning for all those being affected by the Hurricane Harvey. We pray for Rex's brother, who is serving on the Houston Fire Department, and all those first responders who, who give up. They leave their families in the middle, in the midst of the storm to answer the alarm, to help complete strangers. Keep them all safe so that when the task is done, they return home to their families and their friends safely. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Heavenly gracious Father, we call on you to be with all the disaster workers, our federal government, the local governments in Texas, the cities, the counties, and the states, all the leaders, that they can work together for the greater good, that they have passion, patience, and understanding of your ways to, to heal the pain and the loss of houses and lives. It is almost, it is, beyond our understanding, the devastation. And only through you may the people of Texas recover. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Heavenly gracious Father, we pray for all those who are, are on our list of illness. We give you thanks that uh, Lily is uh, getting better. We pray for the doctors and nurses that are caring for her. We call on you to be with Janet and Cletus and Andy and our endless prayers for Linda. And Lord, be with those who are on our minds and in our hearts at this time. Bring them health and may they know your presence in all things. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Well, Heavenly Father, we pray for all our homebound those who cannot be with us this day, that your presence come to them through those who visit them, those who care for them. May they know your love each and every day. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for Rex, 
for our congregation. By your life-giving power, bind us to each other in, your, in you. Strengthen us for service. Support us all our days and bring us at length to all day when all your children will be one with you and always. And to your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, many of you know Rex, and you can use this time. So please stand. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share that peace among one another. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made for the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord to be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and ever-living God, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Please stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. 
Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those whom you have fed with one heavenly food through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said to his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. <laughs> 